Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. As the winter term begins at Britain's universities, this week we're looking at what life is really like for foreign students studying in a pandemic world. We'll be finding out why Chinese students outnumber Europeans at UK universities for the very first time. Plus student charter, the problems of getting from home to the classroom. And online versus in person? We'll consider the COVID effect on university teaching. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, more than 13,600 Chinese students came to study at UK universities this year. A new record. And now for the first time, the number coming from China has outstripped those coming from EU member states, which dropped to just 12,900 a full 56% lower than the previous year. The question now is whether that's a permanent or a temporary change. Fees for international students are typically higher than the $12,900 maximum charged for domestic tuition by English universities. But with the pandemic far from over, many universities are still reluctant to return to entirely face-to-face -face tuition. And with airline tickets often hard to find and expensive, it makes studying overseas a tricky proposition. Some universities have had to charter flights to get their students to the UK. And yet still the Chinese in particular seem keen to get to study at some of the UK's top universities. And the return of the post-student work visa in the UK has also helped. It allows students to stay in the UK for a certain time to work or seek a job after completing their studies. In a post-Brexit period, UK universities need to do as much as they can to encourage students from countries outside the EU, especially China. The cultural and especially the economic benefits are simply too good to miss out. To discuss all that in more detail, I'm joined now by Vivian Stern, the Director of Universities UK International. Vivian, we talked to you here on the agenda almost, what, a year ago now about the impact of the COVID pandemic on international students here in the UK. And it was far from clear at that point uh, how the academic year would pan out. So how has the uh, picture changed in the last 12 months? Well, I think we've all been quite surprised. I think when we spoke last, we weren't sure that international students would still feel that they could travel internationally for study. We thought that all of that activity might just cease. And in fact, what we found is that students are pretty resilient, they're pretty determined, and that you know, the numbers of students registered with UK universities in many cases grew rather than shrinking. So I think it indicates that people, um, and perhaps particularly young people, aren't willing to put their plans on hold uh, because of the pandemic. Well, you're right. I mean, the, there was good news, wasn't there, for British universities. Uh, 272,500 uh, international students started at UK universities and that's up by 7% on last year. So why do they want to come to Britain to study? Well, I think there are a couple of things that have happened. First of all, um, the UK has always been a really popular destination for uh, students who are looking to study um, abroad. Um, but for the last decade or so, I would say that the UK had a pretty difficult policy uh, environment. We weren't very generous when it came to visas, for example. And in particular, we and made it very hard for international students who came to study with us to stay and work after they graduated. That has changed. And I think we saw an immediate impact on the, uh, the level of interest in studying in the UK when those visa changes were introduced. I think the other thing is that um, inevitably during the uh, last year or so, we've seen a number of uh, very popular destinations for international students who haven't reopened their borders. Um, throughout the last year, uh, and a half, Australia and New Zealand have um, been shut. So any student who wants to study with an Australian or New, New Zealand university has to study fully online. Many of them have been willing to do that. But we know that for international students, the, the kind of total immersion that you get from being in a different country, being uh, you know able to experience life uh, in uh, another country and all of the things that go with that is really important. So I think the UK benefited slightly from, from that. Uh, and that's quite explicable, isn't it? Because that's what you want as a young student, to immerse yourself in, in a foreign, a different culture. But what we are also seeing 
is more students coming to Britain from China than from EU member states. And why is that? Well, I mean, the UK has been uh, experiencing really strong growth in demand from Chinese students for a number of years. And it's been, uh, I mean, I think it's been a real success story. Um, we have at the same time seen a decline in um, interest from uh, European destinations. And that's partly, I think, a consequence of Brexit. So looked at from one perspective, whilst European students are thinking twice about whether they can still come to the UK uh, following our departure from the EU, Chinese students in many cases saw that that meant that lots of universities, you know, would have spaces available effectively for, um, for Chinese applicants. And it may be that that's also influenced um, the propensity of students, particularly seeking really selective, highly selective programs in, in very prestigious institutions to increase their, their, their interest. I don't know how long lasting the European effect will be. I suspect that demand will recover a little bit. Um, but at the moment, that shift is, uh, I think, with us for a few years. And obviously, students are important economically. But I, I wonder, because universities, some say, are turning into businesses more than academic institutions. Is there a risk if this continues, they will take those overseas students coming uh, for granted? Well, I mean, the first thing is they're not really businesses. Most, if not all, not all, but most universities in the UK are charities, which means that they don't distribute a But profit. that's for tax they, reasons, isn't it? No, it's because, um, the, I mean, the fundamental difference is that anything that a university receives in terms of income from uh, uh, research or for um, student tuition gets invested back into research and tuition. So it's, you know, these things contribute to being able to provide a great place for students to learn. Now, of course, universities want to expand the resources they've got available to invest in teaching and re learning, but it's not going off into, um, you know, shareholders, it's going back into the uh, academic uh, life of the institution. Um, so it is important, um, but those students who come, they contribute, and they contribute not only sort of to the intellectual life of the university, but they also contribute to the university's ability to provide you know, one of the world's best places to study at tertiary level. A lot of the universities, Vivian, as you know, are still teaching majority of their courses online. I mean, that's not value for money, is it? I mean, overseas it's students coming true. a long way. Uh, but you know, there are a substantial number still teaching online. They're not giving the face-to-face -face experience that the overseas students are paying a lot of money for. No, that's not that's not true. So there's been a lot of confusion about this because um, many universities are keeping lectures online. So those large format teaching uh, activities where you might have 100 or, or more people in one room together, those activities in some cases, in many cases, are still happening online. But it's really important to understand that's not the primary mode of teaching in British universities. All universities in our membership are doing face-to-face -face teaching this term. It's absolutely uh, essential in all of those courses where you need um, you need practical hands-on access to laboratories or maker spaces or studios or, or um, the kind of um, practice-based learning that you have to undertake in lots of professional uh, disciplines. Um, it's also really important in our system that we get small groups together to uh, you know, to take part in seminars, in group-based learning, all of that stuff is happening face-to-face. Um, -face. The message, though, to any student or parent who's worried about this is call the university that you're interested in studying in and ask them, what are they doing? What are they, how are they mixing face-to-face -face, um, tuition and online? And where they're teaching online, why are they doing that? Is that going to be a short-term measure because they want to limit the spread of COVID, which is necessary at the moment, or is it going to remain online because they think that for some reason that's a more effective way of teaching? And there are cases where that is does seem to be um, true, that w when a bit of um, uh, a course is delivered in a certain way online, that students benefit from that. So I don't think it will disappear with COVID, but it's always going to be alongside face-to-face, -face, and our universities are teaching face-to-face. Are overseas students becoming more important than domestic students? No, oh, there's a balance. I mean, the university, the majority of students in universities are from the UK. They're UK domiciled. 
um, and universities have a very important social role in our education system. It's not that we don't think that universities should serve their communities and the national um, education system. So it's always going to be a balance. But we would argue that when UK students go to universities that have international populations, that everybody benefits. And I think it's important, um, particularly at university level, that students have exposure to people from different cultures and different countries and, and different backgrounds. And I think that makes our education system better because we want to challenge the way that people think. We want to give them an idea of um, different parts of the world that they may only have a very dim um, idea about uh, when they start university. So it's a very important thing to have a diverse student population in British universities. Vivian Stern, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. My pleasure, thank you. So that's the view from the United Kingdom, but what about the view from China? Joining me now from Beijing is Dr. Wang Yan, who is a senior specialist and associate research fellow at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Wang Yan, the number of Chinese students uh, here in the United Kingdom has more than doubled in the last five years to almost 13, well, over 13,000 this year. Uh, what do you put that down to? If you look at the cost, the economic cost uh, for studying in UK in comparison with that in the United States, uh, the combined cost of the tuition and living expenses is relatively lower than that of studying in the United States. I think the increased number of international students in UK also related to the people's safety concern because uh, the, uh, there is the relatively lower number of COVID-19 cases and also lower mortality rates in UK uh, thanks to the effective measures in preventing the COVID-19 compared with other major uh, destination international education. And then if we look at the benefits, uh, there are many choices of pre prestigious higher education institutions in UK. Uh, there are uh, over past uh, uh, several years, there are always more than a quarter of uh, universities based in UK in the uh, world university ranking uh, league table such as QS. And there is also a great variety of choices of course offerings, not only in terms of the fields of study, but also in terms of the modes of instruction. For example, even before the COVID-19, as far as I know, the uh, University College uh, uh, London has uh, already offered a doctor degree online. And uh, also uh, uh, the students who study in UK has a lot of opportunities to uh, access advanced technology and, and research. And do you see that trend continuing? I think the trend would continue if the UK can uh, keep the comparative advantage in international education. First is it will uh, remain at uh, uh, remain to be a, a secure and safe place uh, in the post-COVID-19 era uh, uh, de determined by the effective measures uh, of uh, preventing the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And the second is uh, the quality of higher education uh, in terms of the position in the international or world university ranking and also the choices of the uh, cost offerings, especially in terms of the flexible modes of or hybrid modes of instructions. And uh, also it will depend on uh, the cost, uh, the tuition and the living expenses combined. That I believe is uh, largely determined by the economic performance of the country. What do you think Chinese students get from studying in the UK that they can't get in China? Well, the quality higher education uh, is very competitive to secure a place in the top ranking university in China actually now. And uh, so uh, the Chinese students can seek the alter alternative opportunities. That's a place in prestigious higher education institutions in the UK. And then the, uh, this uh, international education 
provided by the universities in UK can increase their uh, employability in a globalized labor market. And uh, also uh, they will have uh, more connections in the, uh, not only in UK, but also because of the international student body yeah. in the uh, globally that can help them with their future employment uh, opportunities and also career development opportunities. And help their English as well, I, I suppose. What about traffic, Wang Yen, the other way? Uh, are many British students going to China to study? Well, I think the traffic in the future over the long run will be definitely two-way, uh, as there will be increasing number of Chinese students who study in UK. There will also be increasing number uh, of students uh, from UK to choose to study in China. And uh, uh, well, especially nowadays, the Chinese government is uh, committed to its open door policy in international education exchange and cooperation. There are many ongoing uh, projects uh, of the student exchange, provider mobility, research cooperation, the people to people exchange. And uh, with the government's commitment to, to education cooperation with the uh, uh, UK and also uh, other countries in the world, I believe there will be more and more opportunities and also more and more policies to support the UK British students to study in UK. Lastly, uh, Wang Yen, do you think the education sector is affected by political disputes between the two countries? And uh, if it is, can exchanging students between the two countries become a sort of icebreaker for relations? Well, uh, the, if the political disputes can affect the international student mobility, I think really depends on the uh, nature and the consequence or impact of such political disputes. Uh, so, uh, well, at times political disputes might affect the uh, student mobility, uh, for example, uh, in terms of there is any uh, xenophobia and in cases when there won't be effective measures to counter such xenophobia. But over the long run, I believe that education will always play a conducive role uh, for uh, building the uh, mutual understanding and mutual trust between two countries because education by uh, imparting the knowledge and also the, uh, uh, the uh, building the understanding, uh, uh, cultivating students, uh, the understanding of the other culture and also the, their abilities to uh, communicate with the people from other culture. Uh, so in this way, education not only can be an icebreaker, but also can play a constructive positively constructive role uh, between the, in the bilateral relations. It certainly can. Dr. Wang Yan, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the agenda. It was very enjoyable. Thank you, Stephen. Still to come here on the agenda, student life. We'll be finding out what it's really like for a Chinese student studying in London. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the agenda. Well, we've heard from the educational experts, but now it's time to hear from someone living life as an international student here in the UK. Uh, I'm joined by Dung Hanzu, who's just starting her master's degree at Goldsmiths at the University of London. Hanzu, how have your first few weeks been in London? Uh, it's quite nice, actually, because uh, um, it's 
actually uh, better than I have expected. I thought it was uh, could be some uh, a lot more restrictions on our life, but actually it's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Um, and why did you choose to come to the United Kingdom uh, to study? I had also considered other countries such as some European countries uh, like France or Germany, but uh, we need also to take the some you need to take the language and the budget and the time spent on studying into consideration to make a decision. And I also had some friends who had studied in UK before and they share, share their experiences with me. Then I, I finally decided that UK is the right place for me. And was it because mainly of the course you're studying or because of all the other activities and, and hopefully the fun you'll have outside the course? Oh, I think both, both are very important because I, I, I studied design now. So uh, UK is actually a very, very, very uh, a country with very thick culture and its art and design activities are quite vigorous here and especially here in London. There are a lot of galleries and museums I can visit and to uh, to uh, that, that's quite helpful for my course and um, also for my uh, outside course activities. Now, uh, your mother, I think Hanzu is a teacher. What, what was her reaction when you said, I want to go to London? Um, her first reaction was a kind of supportive, I think, uh, because um, Oh, when I was quite young, I guess, I have taught her some, some kind of thinking, it's like I wanted to go abroad when I, grad, uh, when I, when I grow up, something like that. So he, he find, she, should, she actually find it quite natural that I have, I have such kind of uh, decision. Uh, but uh, later on, she, she, she also um, showed some, um, some concern, like, uh, because it's under, uh, the COVID-19 circumstances, whether it's, it would be safe or not, and also, also whether I would be adapted, I, I, I can adapt here uh, well, fit well into the, the, the environment here. Uh, she, she also shows some concern about that, but overall she's quite supportive. And you came here um, under your own steam, as we say in English, meaning you didn't come on a charter flight. And some universities are chartering flights, aren't they? Is that a sustainable way forward? Or will you and your fellow students in China, do you think, come um, uh, on your own, on your own flights? Uh, I think that the charter flight is quite good arrangement. But it also has, has some limitations because it's departed on designated date and designated city. And be, uh, but be, before you are booking, uh, you also need to consider your visa application. And if you, you if the flight the offer didn't didn't start or didn't uh, fly from the city, you are leaving. You need to travel travel twice or twice more to get to that flight and um, it's uh, actually there is no big difference between that 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 offered flight and you choose on your own and it's more flexible if you choose on your own but um, in in terms of safety or convenience maybe uh, if you live in a city that the uh, the offer a seat offer the flight for you in your in where you live, if that would be a good choice. And how much of your course will still be online? Actually, uh, our, uh, the, according to our school, school regulation, they said that the, the B course, like uh, a lecture or a course that included less interactivities between students and teachers are will be delivered online and other sessions like a seminar or a tutorial that involves more interaction between students and teachers or among students will be delivered in person. Um, so in, because I am in the course of design, which means it's quite practical and it, it involves a lot of uh, um, 
get our hands dirty sessions. So my course is actually uh, um, delivered pretty much on offline actually. So that, that's quite good. At least much better than students who came last year. <laughs> And what about your fellow students, Hanzu? Where are they from? Uh, uh, are there others from China? I, I think it's uh, largely due to the pandemic situation, uh, pand pandemic reason. So uh, there are a lot of students who wanted to come here last year, but actually they couldn't make it, and so they chose to come this year. As a result of which, plenty of my classmates are actually Chinese. <laughs> and <laughs> so plenty of them are Chinese. That's, that's very interesting. What, what, what yeah. uh, some of the British universities would like is if you study in London, you study in the UK, but then you stay on afterwards so we can make use of your talents. Uh, are you likely to stay on in the United Kingdom? Uh, I'm, I haven't made up my mind now, but I have the consideration to work for some some time if after I graduate here and to gain some work work experience here. That would be nice, but I haven't had further decision for further future. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a very fair answer. You're a long way off from uh, getting your masters. Hanzu, many thanks to you. The very best of luck with your studies, and thank you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you. Studying abroad may be one of the most beneficial experiences for a student. In fact, it can be an education in itself. It gives students an opportunity to experience a foreign country with different outlooks, cultures, traditions, activities. London is also a wonderful and diverse jumping off point for exploring other parts of Europe, such as the neighboring cities of Paris, Rome, or Barcelona. As Chinese campuses begin to rise in the ranks of the global university league tables, students could choose to study on their home turf, but official figures suggest that for those looking to study overseas, the UK remains the destination of choice. As Dr. Wang Yang mentioned, the competition to enrol at Chinese universities is cutthroat. Last year, the acceptance rates in most provinces were under 40%. If we only look at China's top universities, the ones ranked in the global best 500, that rate drops to less than 2%, perhaps giving students the chance to get a better education in the UK, if, of course, you can afford it. Tuition fees for cross-border students are twice as much as that for domestic students, and that's before you consider accommodation costs compared with the prices in China. To secure this income, UK universities have deployed strict measures to limit the spread of coronavirus while restoring some face-to-face -face teaching activities. As Vivian Stern told me, online lectures are not the primary teaching method in British universities. Students also get face-to-face -face tutorials and practical hands-on access to laboratory and studios. And that's why we see an historically high number of Chinese coming to study in the UK despite the pandemic. Overseas students are also considered to be more inclusive. They can play a constructive role among nations. Chinese students coming to the UK will not only get a chance to see Great Britain closely, but can also tell their British counterparts what China is really like. So with more exchanges, the two countries can surely only better understand each other, forging ever closer relations. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda, is hydrogen the answer to ending our reliance on fossil fuels? But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>